I won't need the full half hour, so unless there's more discussion, you'll even be able to head to the airport early. But I did want to make a, a few wrap-up points. There we go. First thing, this is impossible. You can't wrap up an intense two and a half or two days, um, in a half hour, even a few hours. I'm not even going to try to do that. Uh, so far, I think the only regret I have about um, this meeting is if, if I would have thought through it, knowing that we were having Eric Borwinkle speak early, and Eric Lander will always say things, and having me with the same first name. There were multiple times where, I, and the, as the meeting went on, Eric said this, Eric said that, I was confused the whole time whether I said it. So when there was really an insightful comment, I just attributed it to me, and when it was really stupid, I attributed it to one of the other Eric's. But in retrospect, we should have had a rule. You had to have a rule which Eric we were talking about. Well, it's called lossy compression. Ah, uh, is that what it is? <laughs> I'll just smile and pretend I actually get that joke, okay? <laughs> yeah, some of you laughing, you don't get it either, so don't, don't fool me. Okay, um, it's, been, it's been quite a couple of days. I'm sure our, some of our heads will spin for another couple of days. I, I think I would um, start by just saying I warned you. Um, I showed you earlier this, and I, I got to believe this is sort of very much, at least the way I feel. I mean, lots of good options. Some of them maybe go in parallel, maybe even some of them converge, but we can't do all of them. So I think, and even some of the discussion we heard at the very end, where we really can't be everything to everyone, and we do have finite resources. Um, but nonetheless, I, we heard a lot of good things, and if anything, the way, reason our head is spinning is because we heard very motivated people, really bright people, telling us lots of really important and, and good things, and we've just got to sort of sort it out uh, moving forward. Um, as anticipated, we knew from the people we were inviting, indeed, the discussion has been quite vigorous. It's been vigorous inside uh, this room for two days, uh, but we also noted that it has been quite vigorous outside of this room. <laughs> for two days. I credit this photo to Maggie Bartlett, our staff photographer. You got to admit it's a winner. And I, you know, I, I, and I can't help but think when Adam said that, you know, he actually, when he was young, wanted to be a, a zookeeper. This is what his career became, you know. And that is us agreeing. I know. This <laughs> yeah. Well, we actually have the other one. You just used a different finger, I noticed. <laughs> but remember, this is being video cast and video archived on government computers, so we had to be careful. Well, in any case, um, so let me tell you um, just sort of a, a number of things, and uh, it's not going to be lengthy necessarily. Um, I just thought of what was of interest to me, I set this whole thing up with the opening presentation where we laid them some things out that I had staff work with me on to sort of frame what our expectations were. But I, I've got to tell you, having gone through a number of these meetings, whether it's for the sequencing program or whether it's for our strategic planning effort, a lot of times you go in with a framework and then sometime during that two days the whole framework gets blown up and then gets put back together and that didn't quite happen not that we came in with a strict framework but we came in with some ideas um, and um, to be honest with you i was surprised by what i didn't hear and this is me just sitting at my computer today and just thinking about stuff um, and I, I admit going in i think over, at least over the last four and a half years from time to time I might have been persuaded that I might have heard some things, um, but I didn't hear them uh, at this meeting. For example, um, I didn't hear, uh, at least uh, not overtly, the idea that we should just sink our flagship. So I started out with a metaphor of what our genome sequencing program over the years has been a flagship, and I didn't hear uh, at least a strong outcry, really any outcry, to just sink the thing, that it was time to disband it completely, that it didn't have value. I thought that was important. I laid out for you at least my seven major characteristics that have been to date. And actually, I've heard them parroted back in ways, mostly constructive ways, of these are sort of adjectives that describe what our genome sequencing program has been associated with. And I didn't hear change these characteristics. In fact, some ways I heard them referred to in supportive ways or ways of using these to harness new opportunities of going forward. I would notice that when um, we published this uh, in 2011, um, the, the, the biggest thing we faced at the time we published it and certainly subsequently 
both within the staff of NHGRI, absolutely at council, and some of it's probably on video cast you could watch, and certainly among the community, were, were views either that this, which implied sort of a progression from more basic research activities to more clinical applications, either that we were being way overreaching by going too fast, or we were being incredibly um, um, uh, not realizing the opportunities and were going too slow. And uh, I, heard, I heard both views quite loud. In fact, usually I heard it quite shrill. And what, one thing I did notice at this meeting um, was that, um, that we didn't really hear that we were either moving too fast or too slow. And in fact, it just wasn't particularly shrill. I mean, yes, there might be people advocating for some aspects of the different domains more than others, but I didn't hear an overt cry that we had it completely wrong in terms of the pace that we're trying to make uh, this progression happen. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I sort of laid out a number of things about what NHGRI wants, um, and, but it was our opinion that, again, we could have been argued with, and I didn't really hear very many cries of NHGRI as the wrong wants, that we don't have it quite right. So uh, I thought that was important. And I even laid out as the last item here an idea which um, is a little different than what we've done in the past of to maybe building in some formal cost sharing associated with our large scale type efforts associated with our genome sequencing program, and I floated this idea of consider a, a formalizing an approach for cost sharing um, and the rationale for it, and interestingly, I actually didn't hear that cost sharing won't work. In fact, I've heard from several people ideas around specific projects of, yes, this would be a great example where cost sharing could work, would work, should work, and even some ideas of who to go and maybe try to partner with to make it happen. So this idea was not shouted down. Now, that's all quite good, but that doesn't mean this is all going to be easy, and in fact, very little of this is going to be easy. So, if I think about what I've heard the past couple of days, and, um, and, and both in this room and in, as I floated through all the breakout groups yesterday, and I spent a half hour in each of the four over the two-hour period, and just listening to things that were said, uh, there are a number of things that will keep me up at night uh, worrying, because that's my job, is to worry. Uh, one of them is, uh, is the fact that keep hearing over and over again, NHGRI leadership is critical, NHGRI leadership is critical, and that's very um, great to hear and appreciate. Uh, that does come with a significant amount of work, and where that leadership has to be implemented is um, sometimes at very uh, tough, tough places, um, and uh, that's going to require a lot of effort on the part of uh, not only um, myself, but more importantly, a very heavily worked staff with a lot on their plate. When, when you say NHGRI leadership, that means a lot of energy extended, uh, ex being, being given by some very, uh, very senior level uh, division directors and program directors. So that comes with a cost. Uh, the second thing that'll keep me up a little bit at night is I am seeing, and others have commented to me, uh, and maybe it's a good thing, but it just, we have to think about it organizationally as a blurring among some of our programs. We have a very, as I framed on the first day, our flagship program with its clear-cut components. But you even heard in some of the talks yesterday and today how there's many opportunities that are spilling beyond those flagship components and into some other areas. Uh, genome function comes to mind in particular, some of the other activities in our genomic medicine portfolio. And, and w this blurring, I think, is going to, I'm sure, will, will result in some discussion at the NHGRI level and at the council level as we go to think about um, moving forward with our flagship program and which of the ways it interacts or incorporates or moves over or whatever into these other aspects of NHGRI in ways that I don't think it was as much of an issue three or four years ago as it seems to be now. I also think what will keep me up at night is, and this is always an issue, is defining our external boundaries. I think that's just getting harder and harder, not easier. Maybe naively, I thought it might get easier, but where, do, where does NHGRI stop in terms of what its responsibilities are? And I'm not even talking about you know, disease areas versus non-disease areas, but even issues about where do we start treading into water that's more of a regulatory, or, 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 or something that would, a regulatory agency might do, or something an educational group might do, and so on and so forth. I, I, a lot of expansive ideas, maybe because our leadership can be effective in some quarters, but where our boundaries are, and again, all this comes with energy and time of staff. We can't do everything, and defining the boundaries, I think, is important to us. Uh, obviously, budgetary climate, it's not that it's bad, it's as much bad as it is just frustrating. It's hard to know which way the trajectory is going, and there's 
reasons to be quite pessimistic, and there's other signs that maybe things will get better. But doing all of the things we've talked about for two days, knowing that the budgetary climate is at, or the budgetary situation is certainly not stable and well-defined, makes it very frustrating to make decisions, especially decisions that might have two, three, four-year implications. And then, of course, there's this um, uh, comment that came up multiple times as recently as about 10 minutes ago that, you know, other NIH institutes don't know how to do this well, which is a little uncomfortable at first when I hear it because, of course, we have representatives from other institutes right here who have been very nice to sit through uh, two days of this meeting um, and occasionally hear that they're not doing it as well. Um, and not to mention that the word will get back to the institute directors and the institute directors will talk to me about what they're not doing well and so forth. But then it gets particularly concerning when the next thing out of somebody's mouth is, and, and I need to go tell them that they're not doing it well. So, um, uh, but there, there, are, there is sort of this issue of there's, there are things that we have done well over the years, and we are models of how to do them, um, and, and clearly we would like to influence the style at which some of the science is being done on some of these projects, but we do have to be sensitive partners with our colleagues at NIH, but we can't tell them how to do it. We have to hopefully um, convince them to partner with us and try it our way if they haven't done it before, or have them you know, see ways, or when they've experienced by working with us, ways to, to go forward in a very uh, concerted and organized way with us. Um, and then last thing is this idea of cost sharing, recognizing that this is not going to be easy. Money's not plentiful for anybody. And the idea of trying to take any of the initiatives that were new, that were named, or any of the ideas of expanding and trying to broker those deals, either at NIH with others or beyond, whether it's other agencies or private foundations and so forth, that's going to require uh, significant work and energy, and we're going to have to just deal with it. And, um, and I'm prepared to, to move forward on that, but it is certainly one of the things that will keep me up at night. But, you know, lastly, what I want to say is uh, I don't want to end on, on sort of what's going to keep you up at night as anything negative. I actually think uh, this, I'm coming out of this meeting even more optimistic than when I went into it. I am profoundly optimistic, and I'll give you six reasons what I wrote down why. Uh, and, and many of you have commented on it, but I just have to start with it. I mean, I, there's no question the scientific medical opportunities are spectacular. There's no question genomics is greatly contributing to that incredible set of opportunities, and there's no question the collective energies and accomplishments of people in this room, and then thereby representing the genomics community more widely, deserve a lot of credit for it. So that just has to make you feel really quite good if you think back on what's gone on in genomics over the last 25 years and what we have all collectively contributed. It's made these opportunities spectacular. I think there's Terrific ideas, probably too many of them, but terrific ideas that have emerged from this workshop. Even the last hour, we found new things I was writing down, a new idea. So there's no shortage of good ideas to help populate an incredibly exciting landscape. Um, and I will also say, and it came out again, even the last couple of hours, I am very flattered on behalf of the entire institute and even hearing the last things about the great program directors we have. There seems to be incredible confidence in NHGRI by people here. Now, maybe that's because we invited you here, we invited our friends, but no. <laughs> in all seriousness, I think what we hear repeatedly is part of the genomic way that NHGRI does business is very much intertwined with the style and the staff and the style of the staff. And uh, I would just say we appreciate hearing that and you give us that confidence and that will help sort of give us the energy and uh, the motivation to move forward. But it does certainly makes me optimistic as leading the institute. And then I was gratified to, I floated the balloon about this cost sharing models and there appears to be optimism, some people particularly optimistic about doing this. And maybe there's even some optimism of things going on that maybe with the budgetary situation will improve more generally. Obviously nobody really knows that, that's much more tied up into politics. But there does seem to be optimism about for us to explore these cost sharing models. Um, some of which where we might have to go figure out who the partners are, but some of it might be that the grantees have to go help us figure out where the other partners might be for cost sharing some of these uh, large projects and having that be a more integral part of, of this program. Um, I did write down several cases where things that we were criticized for a few years ago suddenly were being complimented about. And I have to admit that feels good because uh, certainly I can think back on three years ago when our strategic plan came out or when we renewed the sequencing program, there's some criticisms around some of the new things we were doing and I wrote down when I heard somebody say, well, I was once a, a critic of this but now I can see this is really a good program so I'm glad to see that we're being complimented about tough decisions we had to make three, four years ago. 
And finally, and I already mentioned this, I was pleased to see that, that uh, because three years ago, there was, I think, a much greater shrillness associated with basic science, translational science, clinical science going on in the genomics field. And I just think that that debate is just, while it's still there, and I think it's a healthy debate, it's just less shrill, it's a little less personal, and I think it's much more in a constructive tone, and I'm really pleased to see that. And actually, I think there was a lot of good ideas coming up across all quarters where somebody at one end of a spectrum might be giving some constructive ideas for enhancing activities and proposing activities at the other end of that continuum, and I think that's a very healthy way to have things go. So our job now, meaning NHGRI's job, is to fill in the, le the far right part of this. Uh, we uh, actually have a meeting that starts in about an hour and 20 minutes, a postmortem among staff to start to think about this and start planning. Uh, that will lead to a discussion that will take place um, in the open session of our council meeting um, uh, in September. And uh, from there, we will move forward to figure out what the to be determined is going to be and what the green elements below shown now as question marks are going to be. Uh, so stay tuned. That's what follows this in the coming weeks and the coming months, again, starting almost immediately. And I'll end with where I began, uh, just by saying thank you. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming and all of you who have participated, either in person or remotely. Um, I do want to say a special thanks, and maybe it sort of is consistent with what I said earlier about the confidence you have in NHGRI very much reflects the confidence you have in our program directors. Uh, um, Adam Felsenfeld, as you can see, really leads, both, both leads this program, but leads a team of people. Uh, Shannon, in particular, was very helpful with logistics, but the other program directors that work on team sequence, as we call them, in our sequencing program, but others that have been recruited into this, and you saw various other program directors who maybe previously weren't formally part of the genome sequencing program coming up and helping co-chair and being a vital part of this conversation. I thank all the program directors as well because I think it is what makes NHGRI uh, unique and get the compliments that they've been getting uh, throughout this meeting. So thanks again, and importantly, it doesn't end because you all know where, how to get a hold of us. And uh, please keep your feedback coming. Uh, we have been getting emails already from some of you, things you want to share with us, at least uh, more privately, or just ideas you didn't want to bring to the floor. Uh, we love those emails, and I'm sure we'll get more of them. Keep them coming. You seem to know my email address, and you know Adam's, and that's fine. And we'll share with each other, so you can send to either one of us. Uh, but do keep your feedback coming in the days and weeks ahead. It'll be uh, important for us uh, then, as much as all the feedback you've given us so far uh, in the past two days have been. So uh, with that, I will end uh, the meeting, and I would say uh, thanks again for coming. Uh, safe travels back, and I'm sure we'll be seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.